My name is Dr. Benjamin Rattray. I'm going to be talking about duodenal atresia. The learning objectives, we will seek to describe the anatomy of duodenal atresia, to identify the causes and clinical features of this condition, and to outline diagnosis and management of this condition. Duodenal atresia is found in about 1 per 5,000 live births, and it accounts for half of all small intestinal atresias. Congenital duodenal obstruction may be complete or partial, intrinsic or extrinsic. Atresias occur in various anatomic configurations, including a blind end pouch with no connection to the distal duodenum, which is the least common, a pouch with a fibrous cord connected to the distal duodenum, or a complete membrane obstructing the lumen, which is the most common. Perforate membranes are also a cause of duodenal stenosis. All three lesions occur with greatest frequency near the ampullary evator, with most lesions, 80% or so, occurring distal to this landmark. Extrinsic obstruction has many causes, including malrotation with LADS bands, preduodenal portal vein, gastroduodenal duplications, cysts or pseudocysts of the pancreas and biliary tree, and annular pancreas. Annular pancreas occurs when pancreatic tissue surrounds the duodenum, causing complete or incomplete duodenal obstruction. It results as a failure of the regression and rotation of the ventral bud. Duodenal atresia or stenosis is seen in all cases of annular pancreas. It is considered a secondary change rather than a primary cause of duodenal obstruction. Duodenal atresia and stenosis are believed to result from a failure of recanalization of the embryonic duodenum. At five weeks of embryonic life, the lumen of the duodenum is obliterated by proliferating epithelium. The patency of the lumen is usually restored by the 11th week, and failure of canalization may lead to stenosis or atresia. This is distinct from atresia or stenosis of the jejunum and ileum, which are thought to be caused by vascular accidents in utero. Associated anomalies. Approximately 50% of cases of duodenal atresia have associated anomalies. Congenital heart disease and trisomy 21 are the most common associated conditions, each occurring in about 30% of cases. The other associated anomalies are usually related to the bacterial group, such as vertebral, anorectal, cardiac, tracheoesophageal, renal, and limb abnormalities. The outcome for patients with duodenal atresia depends more on the se severity of these associated anomalies and the ease to which they can be corrected, more than on the surgical management of the obstruction itself. In addition, for unknown reasons, more than 50% are born prematurely. Clinical presentation. The clinical presentation of the infant with congenital duodenal obstruction depends on the absence or presence of membranous aperture, its size, and the location of the obstruction relative to the ampulla. Most cases present with bilious vomiting soon after birth. However, in about 10% of cases, the atresia is preampulary and the vomiting is non-bilious. Infants variably exhibit abdominal distension. Diagnosis. Many patients with duodenal atresia have the diagnosis suggested by prenatal ultrasonography. The cardinal signs on ultrasound are polyhydramnios and a double bubble appearance due to a dilated stomach and proximal duodenum. Polyhydramnios is present in 33 to 50% of cases of duodenal atresia. However, the absence of gastric and proximal duodenal dilation in the presence of polyhydramnios does not exclude the diagnosis because intrauterine emesis may limit preobstructive dilation. An abdominal radiograph demonstrating a double bubble appearance Two distinct gas collections of air fluid levels in the upper abdomen resulting from the markedly dilated stomach and proximal duodenal bowel, and no distal gas is usually diagnostic of duodenal atresia, and no contrast studies are necessary. If the infant's stomach has been decompressed by vomiting or previous nasogastric aspiration, 30 to 60 mLs of air may be injected through that nasogastric tube and the double bubble sign reproduced. Air makes an excellent contrast agent, obviating a barium or water-soluble contrast study in routine cases. The importance of differentiating intrinsic duodenal obstruction from intestinal malrotation with a mid-gut volvulus in the infant who, pre who presents with bilious vomiting cannot be overstated. If distal air is present or if a distended stomach is associated with a normal caliber duodenum, an upper GI contrast study should be obtained rapidly, not only to confirm the diagnosis of duodenal stenosis or atresia, but to exclude mid-gut volvulus, which would constitute a surgical emergency. Management. Preoperative preparation includes nasogastric decompression, 
fluid and electrolyte replacement, and a thorough evaluation for associated anomalies. Prophylactic perioperative antibiotics are begun preoperatively. A carrier type should be sent to evaluate for aneuploidy. Even when the diagnosis of duodenal atresia is established in the stable patient, cardiac anatomy and function should be evaluated before surgical correction. In an unstable patient, echocardiography and contrast studies may be required to distinguish hemodynamic compromise caused by volvulus from that caused by cardiac disease. Classification. Atresias of the duodenum have several basic morphologies. Type 1 atresias are most common and constitute luminal webs or membranes, some of which contain a central defect or a fenestration of variable size and result in a marked size discrepancy with mural continuity. Type 2 atresias have dilated proximal and diminutive distal segments connected by a fibrous cord. Type 3 atresias are characterized by a complete discontinuity between the segments. The relationship between the point of obstruction and the ampullary evader is most important. Most series document a predominance of post ampullary obstructions, although some have described a pre ampullary predominance. Obstructions caused by type 1 membranes are frequently associated with anomalies of the common bile duct in which the common bile duct may terminate within the membrane itself. Surgery and outcome. The approach to repair varies according to the type of anatomic aberration. The surgical management of an intrinsic duodenal web is usually limited to excision of a portion of the web and the enteroplasty to widen the duodenal lumen at that point. As the membrane occasionally contains the terminal common bile duct, Great caution must be taken in excising or incising the membrane to avoid biliary injury and stricture formation. The most widely accepted surgical management of both true atresia and annular pancreas involves constructing an anastomosis between the dilated proximal duodenum and the diminutive distal duodenum. The diamond duodenoduodenostomy has yielded consistently good results and remains the procedure of choice. The diamond anastomosis is fashioned in such a way as to approximate the ends of one incision to the midpoints of the other incision. The tension resulting from this orientation holds the anastomosis open in a self-stenting manner. Duodenal obstruction usually involves the periampular region. However, when the obstruction is more distal involving the duodenal ileal flexure or proximal jejunum, the duodenum may be massively dilated and hypertrophied. A conventional enteroenterostomy in this situation is likely to fail as a result of functional obstruction associated with impaired motility at the dilated segments of the duodenum. This is best treated with a tapering enteroplasty, such that the end di diameter equals the diameter of the collapsed, collapsed jejunum to which it is to be anastomosed. Concomitant distal atresia occurs in about 3% of cases and should be ruled out by injecting saline into a distal limb using a soft red rubber catheter. Gastroduodenal function usually returns within five to seven days, at which time enteral feeding can be initiated with small boluses and the volume progressively advanced is tolerated. One of the most problematic issues following repair of duodenal atresia is delayed transit, usually associated with a persistently dilated and dyskinetic proximal duodenum. Even with the preferred diamond anastomosis, a persistent mega duodenum with symptomatic partial obstruction and stasis can occur. This complication may be managed either by tapering duodeno duodenoplasty or bilateral serum muscular resection. Survival rates of 95% are reported, and mortality in most cases are due to associated anomalies. Approximately 12% of patients require revision or other intra-abdominal surgery over a 30-year follow-up period. This concludes this presentation. Please see the additional reading materials.